So, uh, you know, in the context of fermentation, you know, we call organisms that we're working with um, cultures. Um, and at the same time, we also call um, you know, language and scientific knowledge and music and literature and theater and, um, you know, really I'd say the totality of all the things that people seek to pass down from generation to generation, you know, though that's also culture. And, you know, I would just suggest that, uh, you know, as, as a whole, uh, uh, fermented foods are more than incidental culinary novelties. Um, you know, I already said agriculture wouldn't be possible without them. Um, you know, when, when you hear people's uh, you know, migration journeys, people who have had the ability to sort of bring their most precious belongings with them on their migration journeys, always brought their food cultures. Um, so, you know, there's many families around the United States that have sourdough cultures or yogurt cultures or other kinds of food cultures that they're uh, you know, that, that, their, that their ancestors were brought over with them, and in some cases, people have been perpetuating them for, for you know, many generations. Um, you know, the, the, the relationship between these sort of notions of culture, the, the, the big, you know, broad, global sense of culture and the little microbial sense of culture, um, you know, the, the, the word culture comes from, uh, you know, the Latin word for cultivation, and the idea is that, like, you know, our notions of what could be cultivated have expanded over time. So, you know, it starts with the you know, cultivation of the soil, selecting seeds, all the, you know, the, 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 the cultivation that's involved in, in agriculture. And then, you know, by the time the 20th century comes along, you know, people are culturing cells in, uh, in petri dishes and, 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 and things like that. Um, so we, we, we have had this sort of like expansion of the meaning, but it all goes back to the idea of, of, of cultivating the soil. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, and fermentation really is a, a, an extension um, of, of that. Um, but people's cultural identity also gets very tied up in these foods. And if you look around the world in different culinary traditions, well, well I mean, first of all, if you look at any gourmet food store and look around and think about the nature of the foods that we you know, ed elevate onto the you know, pedestal of gourmet foods, almost all of them are products of fermentation because fermentation creates strong um, uh, flavors. Um, but then also people's uh, you know, notions of cultural identity get very wrapped up in, in some of these strong flavored foods. And you know, particularly the foods that really exist in many different parts of the world that have very strong flavors, that people who grow up inside the culture like learn to love them. They are acquired tastes. But frequently people from outside those cultures um, you know, who, who sort of you know, show up and, and start like tasting foods, like find some of those uh, uh, fermented foods really challenging to eat sometimes. Um, you know, the, 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 the strong flavors of fermentation are not always accessible to everyone. Um, and I think, you know, we all can relate to this in the realm of cheese, right? You know, probably a third of us in this room like, really love a stinky, stinky cheese. And then, you know, we've learned that not everybody shares our passion for that. And, you know, some people, you know, some, some people just would never think about putting that in their mouth because it smells so foul. And, um, and, you know, there are just, like, important survival foods in many different parts of the world that are, that are analogous to that, that, you know, have very strong flavors. You know, you think about, like, you know, the, the, the food that is, uh, you know, in the Arctic Circle. Um, you know, the way people have been able to survive in that harsh environment is by catching fish in the summertime when the waterways are accessible and either uh, uh, burying them in pits or even mounting them on the ground. You know, while it's warm, the food in the, the, the fish is, you know, fermenting, decomposing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, uh, you know, when it gets cold, it freezes and it thaws and it freezes and the process goes like that. And, um, you know, that, that, that is, it is just utterly a survival practice. Without that practice, people never would be able to live in, 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 in that harsh environment. Um, you know, but, but people who, uh, you know, who travel up to that part of the world and haven't been exposed to this, you know, when they encounter fish that's decomposed to the texture of cheese, um, you know, that can be very, very challenging. <laughs> uh, you know, an another reflection of the importance of uh, products of fermentation in culture 
is um, you know, the amount of um, uh, ritual and iconography that's organized around it. Um, so, you know, I mean, really, until, until Louis Pasteur did his work in the 1860s, uh, you know, fermentation was, was something of a mystery, and, um, and uh, you know, it was, it was a very magical process that, you know, people, you know, it, 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 people had to sort of, you know, wait for it to begin. The visible action of fermentation is the bubbles. Now, the word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. It's because the visible action of fermenting liquids is the same as the visible action of boiling liquids. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's the bubbles. So, you know, in, in lots of indigenous cultures all around the world, you know, people had elaborate ritual around that. And in some places, you know, people would dance around the liquids they were trying to ferment, you know, trying to teach them how to dance and, and start to bubble. And then, you know, in other places, they, 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 they approached the ritual in a complete opposite way, where, you know, they thought that it needed stillness and quiet in order to, um, to, to begin. But, you know, sort of either way that it was constructed, you know, people understood this to be a magical process and, 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 and had rituals organized around it. And then, you know, if you look at the, the, the major, uh, you know, world religions, or, or at least those that don't um, 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 uh, prohibit alcohol, um, you know, religious iconography is organized around alcoholic beverages. I mean, it's not some random substance that transubstantiates into the blood of Jesus Christ, is it? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's wine. It's this special magical substance. And, you know, in the, in the Jewish tradition that I grew up in, um, you know, the, 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 the most frequently uh, uh, repeated prayer is Borei Hagafi, which means, blessed is the creator of the fruit of the vine. Um, so, you know, so, so fermentation really, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, cultural significance. Also, looking at just some basic technology that we, that we take for granted. I mean, pottery, trying to imagine the origins of pottery. I mean, what's the incentive to create, you know, vessels that can hold liquid? You know, it's, it's so, so, so we can, you know, ferment beverages in it. And, you know, certainly all of the oldest pottery shards that archaeologists find always turn out to have alcohol residue. Um, uh, on them because you know that that's that that's what they were for, um, you know, and the fact that like you know almost everyone here ate fermented foods today and eat fermented foods every day, um, you know, is another reflection of the you know sort of importance of um, you know fermented foods to um, you know our our, 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 our cultural existence. Um, then finally, I want to address um, uh, community. So. I mean, like culture, community has many different levels to it. And so, you know, we can look at it from the microbial perspective. And, you know, the idea, like, you know, in, in, in any supermarket in our time, you can walk in and you can buy a packet of yeast. Yeast is uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and it is an isolated fungus. Um, and that's, you know, when you can make bread in, you know, two or three hours using a packet of yeast. Um, uh, you know, you can get, uh, you can get a, um, uh, you know, a sugary liquid to start bubbling and fermenting immediately by adding a packet of yeast. But in the natural world, you never find singular microorganisms. Microorganisms exist in communities. And all of the traditional ferments are made with communities of microorganisms. So, you know, our contemporary supermarket beers, you know, are all made with, um, uh, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, like you know, single single culture. Um, but you know, the, the, the tradition of beer making involves uh, you know a combination of, of, of yeasts and also lactic acid bacteria and other types of organisms. Um, and I, I think that I mean this this is significant in terms of like the ability of ferments to self perpetuate. So I just want to do another survey. Okay, how many people here have ever tried making yogurt? Okay, like quite a, quite a few people, like a lot of people dabble in yogurt making. Um, uh, and if you're anything like me, like, okay, you know, when, when, when you decided you want to try to make yogurt, you went to the store and you bought a container of plain yogurt to be your starter. And if you did that, then, you know, your first generation, if you got the temperature manipulation right, your first generation was nice and thick, just about as thick as the yogurt you started with. And then if you made yogurt from that and did a second generation, it wasn't like quite as thick. And then if you did like three or four or five generations, each generation, it becomes less yogurt-like. 
And after, you know, after half a dozen generations, you got to go back to the store and buy another container of yogurt to start with. And this was a huge, huge um, paradox for me. I mean, you know, how could this traditional food have been passed down, you know, through hundreds of generations if it couldn't even be stable for, you know, six batches of yogurt? Um, you know, and, you know not, not everyone in the, you know, sort of yogurt region of the world, like, had a supermarket where they could, like, you know, go buy another, another pack of yogurt to, to be the starter. So, you know, what, what, what I finally figured out is that, um, uh, you know, yogurt was actually one of the earliest uh, fermented foods to be improved by microbiologists. So, you know, the, uh, basically, Eli Mechnikov, who was the uh, Russian director of the Pasteur Institute at the beginning of the 20th century, was interested in yogurt. And he went to Bulgaria, and he got some samples of yogurt, and he looked at it under a microscope, and out of the broad community of organisms that were part of the yogurt, he extracted the two that he believed were the uh, sort of, you know, active principles of yogurt. And, and actually, you know, that's come to legally define yogurt. In the, in the U.S. law, uh, for purposes of international trade through the Codex Alimentarius, yogurt is defined by two bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus, although that one never gets spelled out in the yogurt containers. <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is that, and so you know, our presumption, you know, given the war on bacteria thinking, is that you know any bacteria beyond the most specifically utilitarian bacteria is extraneous and potentially dangerous. So, um, so you know, so that's why microbiologists like to look at that big community, big unruly community, and decide like, okay, we're going to just like extract the ones that we think are responsible for the food. The thing about these like communities of bacteria in traditional foods is that they are evolved communities of bacteria in the food. And evolved communities actually have a structure and community dynamics and defense strategies. So they can protect themselves against other random bacteria they encounter in their environment um, and against uh, you know, bacterial diseases, phages, and other, uh, other you know, phenomena that can, uh, that can uh, you know, attack bacteria. And so you know, the, 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 the yogurt starter that's a broad community evolved over the course of probably thousands of years, although we don't know anything about the origins of any fermented foods because they're all prehistoric. Um, uh, uh, but you know, it, it was stable. It was able to it was able to um, endure through you know hundreds, thousands of years, many generations, many batches of yogurt in a way that picking out two of them cannot. Now I have to assume that for mass production, there's some benefit to using a more limited community of organisms, although I don't specifically know what it is. Um, but for you know, for a, uh, a, a generalist home practitioner, it is you know, it is only disempowering because it makes it impossible to continuously propagate at home. And by the way, you know, thanks to the miracle of the internet, it is possible to obtain heirloom yogurt cultures now. Um, and there, I mean, the, I, I got the one. The, I, well, I got several of them. Um, uh, from a, a, a company that's called culturesforhealth.com. They sell about a half a dozen uh, different heirloom yogurt cultures. And the Bulgarian one that I've been doing, I've done more than 50 generations of it, and every batch is just as beautiful as, as the last batch was. But, but you know, really, like, every, every ferment has a similar story. I mean, tempeh, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I've been making tempeh for about 15 years. Uh, you know, I, I buy the starter in the United States. Uh, pretty much all the starter in the United States, as far as I can tell, is of a single um, uh, 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 fungal species, Rhizopus oligosporus. Um, and, uh, and I learned how to propagate tempeh spores. I wrote about it in the Art of Fermentation. It's absolutely the most technically demanding thing that I have ever, ever done. Um, and, you know, I've only had about a 50% success rate with it. Um, because it's very easy for a single strain of bacteria to, uh, uh, um, or, or, or a fungi to get sort of, you know, let's say, corrupted. You know, just, you know, like other, other things 
come into it and, 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 and you lose it after a couple of generations if you don't, you know, if you don't take extraordinary measures to keep it pure. So it was always like another paradox for me. You know, how did you know how did these people in Java, um, you know, sort of keep this food going over the course of generations and generations? 